You may be seated. Our scripture lesson for today is simply one verse for us to hold in our hearts today. Reading from the letter to the church in Colossae, Colossians chapter 3. Be tolerant with each other, and if someone has a complaint against anyone, forgive each other as the Lord forgave you so also forgive each other. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, as we continue in this series of questions that we ask God, I come to a question today that I believe touches each and every one of our hearts. How and why? Do we forgive one another? Many of you might remember very strongly in your minds the horror that we all felt on June 17th of 2015 when we learned that a 21-year-old white supremacist named Dylan Roof had mercilessly slaughtered nine African American individuals in an adult Bible study at Mother Emanuel AME in Charleston, South Carolina. It was a terrible, terrible day. But for some of us, the horror of that terrible event was also matched by the awe that we felt when we heard the response of some of the family members of those persons who died that day. When members of the victims were confronted with Dylan Roof in court, they said incredible things, like, I forgive you. You took someone very important and precious to me, but I forgive you. I forgive you and my family forgives you, but we would like for you to take this opportunity to repent and confess and to give your life to the one who matters the most, Christ. May God have mercy on you. As one pastor described it, those people that day had just gone through the most terrible and tragic events that any of us can imagine. But there was no hatred in their voice. Sorrow, yes, but no hatred. Only love and forgiveness. How and why? Did they forgive? It's a question that perplexes so many of us, forgiving another person for deep hurts and pains and even for minor inflictions upon us is probably one of the most difficult things that Jesus ever commanded any of us to do. It's one of the most difficult aspects of living a life of faith. The great church father, Augustine, once said that sometimes people in his church omitted the phrase from the Lord's Prayer that says, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. They just sat silently when everybody else prayed that line because they knew if they said it, they'd be lying. I imagine that that would be true for many of us that we should be silent during that portion of the prayer if we have people that we have not forgiven because forgiveness is hard. It's one of the most difficult requirements of our faith. Now, I know we're very good in the church about admonishing people to forgive. 
I told Austin earlier this week, I have preached more sermons on forgiveness than I can count. The Bible talks a lot about forgiveness. But I'm sorry to say that often we are not so good in the church about helping us understand how we can actually do it. So today I want to give us maybe a more practical sermon. And one of the most helpful books I have ever read is this little book by Lewis Smeads called The Art of Forgiving, When You Need to Forgive and Don't Know How. I read it several years ago and gave my copy away to someone, so I had to go to the library and pick up another copy to reread it. It's a very helpful book on how we can forgive. He begins his book by telling us that one of the reasons it is hard to forgive is because of the assumptions that we make about forgiveness. We have some wrong-headed ideas about what forgiveness really means. And he says that one of those wrong-headed beliefs is that forgiveness means minimizing what the person has done to us, minimizing the hurt and the pain. Have you ever heard someone ask for forgiveness and the response is, oh, it's all right, it didn't really matter, it wasn't that bad after all? Or we try to fool ourselves and tell ourselves, I need to get over it because it really wasn't that big of a deal. But my friends, if it wasn't that big of a deal, it wouldn't hurt. And the person wouldn't need to ask for forgiveness and we wouldn't have a need to forgive them. So Lewis Smead says the first thing we need to do is to be honest with ourselves about how we hurt, to be honest with ourselves and with others about the pain that we feel, to acknowledge it, and to say to others, you know, it really hurt my feelings when you did this or when that happened in my life. Instead of stuffing it down. I read another book many years ago about our feelings and the phrase that continues to stick with me is that when we don't acknowledge our feelings and we try to bury them inside of us we don't bury them dead we bury them alive and they'll come out somehow some way often when we least expect it so don't assume that forgiveness means discounting the pain and the hurt that you feel. Instead, be honest and acknowledge it to the other person, but then be ready to listen to the other person's response because often what hurt us was not meant to hurt us by the other person. Maybe we misinterpreted what they did or what they said or the way they said it. And so we need to be willing to listen to them. And often they may say to us, oh, 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 I'm so sorry. I didn't know that was going to hurt you. I didn't realize this is what I should have said or this is the way I should have done it. Please forgive me. So that's the first thing for us to remember. Forgiveness doesn't mean minimizing the pain and the hurt. It means being honest about the pain and the hurt. But the second thing that we need to acknowledge is that forgetting is not the same thing as forgiving. Have you ever heard someone say, you just need to forgive and forget? How'd that work for you? You see, it's not the same thing. Sometimes we will say, well, as soon as I can get over remembering and replaying in my mind what they did to me, then I'll be able to forgive them. I just keep remembering it and thinking about it, but as soon as I can forget it, I will be able to forgive them. But my friends, it's not the same thing. We can't forget 
There are some things that cut so deeply we can't forget, and indeed we shouldn't forget. We need to acknowledge that they existed because we cannot change the past, but what we can change and have influence on is the future. And that's what forgiving is about. Forgiving is about not letting what happened to us in the past affect our future. That we don't drag that pain and that hurt around with us, living like a victim because we've been so wounded by it. Living like a victim is living with the mentality that the other person has power over us and we're allowing them and what they did to us or said to us steal all the happiness and joy from us that we could possibly have in the future because of that cloud that is upon us. Forgiveness means cutting ourselves loose from all of that pain that we're feeling and saying, I am choosing to not let what happened in the past destroy my future, my future for hope and my future for joy and my future for happiness. I'm going to forgive because I don't want to become like the person who hurt me. I don't want to become a person who's bitter and angry in life and who spews out hurts on others. You see, one of the big reasons for forgiving is for our own selves, to release ourselves for the future that God has prepared for us. Forgiveness is not about letting someone else off the hook. It's about making sure that we don't get on the hook of being caught in that loop of living like a victim instead of living like a survivor. And the other important thing to remember is that forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean reunion and restoration of a relationship the way it was before that incident happened. Forgiveness does not mean that you're going to be back in a relationship and everything's peachy keen all over again. Because sometimes that's not the best thing for you or for the other person. Sometimes we just need to part ways so that both of us can go on and live in a future that is filled with goodness and joy and hope and peace again. Forgiveness, my friends, means understanding how we can go on and live in the reality of the world that is in front of us, how we can go on living despite what has happened to us. I think that's why the Bible talks so much about forgiveness. It's because Jesus came to give us an abundant life and he wants us to live that abundant life and not to be burdened and chained down to the things of the past. So Jesus sets us free from the things that we feel guilty about and the ways that we have caught, caused pain and hurt in this world. And he wants us to live with the freedom of not allowing the pains and the hurts that others have inflicted upon us to rob us of that joy. Paul emphasized that point so much, I believe, because he was haunted by the fact that he was the cause of the murder of so many early Christians. Paul understood how hard it is to forgive ourselves and how important it is to live with that forgiveness that Jesus offers to us. And he was able to talk about forgiveness so much because he understood the power of forgiveness in his own life. Living with forgiveness allows us to live in a future with hope. And without forgiveness, there's not much hope for this world that we live in. I know all of you have been following the painful news reports 
of the war that continues to go on in U Ukraine and of all that is happening in Gaza, of the Palestinians and the Israelis and how long that war and that animosity continues to go on. The other day I was reading in my one-year daily Bible reading, and I was reading about Samson. You remember Samson, the mighty warrior? Well, I was reading about Samson, the great judge of Israel, about the story when he retaliated against the Philistines because of what one family had done to him. And so he went out and he burned an entire field. He destroyed an entire group of Philistines because of what one family had done to hurt him. And so in retaliation, the Philistines came after the Israelites to retaliate and seek revenge. And so the Israelites sent a delegation to Samson and they said, what are you doing? These Philistines are attacking all of us because of what you did. Why are you bringing all of this upon us? <laughs> and Samson's reply was so much like what we see going on in the world today and what we are tempted to do ourselves. He said something like, I'm just doing to them what they did to me. Well, my friends, it keeps escalating if we just do to them what they did to us. We become like them. We become the ones who are the oppressors, the ones who injure others. I believe that phrase, I'm just doing to them what they did to me, is what's behind us in our conflicts and genocide in the world today. People wanting to get revenge, but revenge never brings healing to us. Because how much harm and how much hurt do you have to give to someone till you can feel like you've truly avenged and you are free from the pain? that you feel you can't never can we feel like we have given someone so much pain that our pain is healed scripture gives to us much wisdom about how we can let go of the pain that we feel and one of those is for us to see the people who hurt us as humans. To see their humanity. How often do we use words like monster and evil to describe the people who hurt us or the people who cause pain and hurt in this world? Think about the words that have been used to describe Dylan Roof by people who were not those family members that day. Think about the words that we describe, used to describe people who are causing so much dissension and division in our world today. The Bible tells us we need to see all people as God's children created by God. You see, forgiveness is not always about whether or not the person deserves it or even if they acknowledge it. It's about our choice. And one of those choices is to see each of those persons as human. There's a story that sticks out to me that some of you might remember. There have been so many stories coming out of the conflict in Palestine and Israel. But one of those stories back in 2006 is about a Palestinian youth. 
a little boy named Ahmad Ismail Katif. He was out playing one day with some of his other little buddies and like many little boys who grow up especially in war-torn countries, they were playing with little plastic guns. He was playing with one of those little plastic guns that really looked like a real gun. And so one of the Israeli soldiers who was around shot him, thinking that that little boy was holding a real gun. Two days later, Ahmad died in the hospital. And here's the remarkable thing. Ahmad's father donated his son's organs. Donated his son's organs so that others might have the gift of life. But because Ahmad was treated in his Israeli hospital, all of the recipients of his organs were Israelis. It is said that because of his organs, he saved the lives of five children and a 58-year-old woman. And the people back in Ahmad's village couldn't understand why Ahmad's father would do that. They were outraged with his family that they would allow their son's organs to be placed in their enemies' bodies and save some of their enemies. And Ahmad's father said in an interview, I don't mind seeing my son's organs in the body of an Israeli because I want peace for everyone. And I feel that my son has entered the heart of every Israeli. My son has grown up only seeing war and only seeing the Israelis as evil and as enemies. And the Israeli children have only seen me and my family as enemies. I hope, I hope that my son's organs will help us all see that we are all human. My friends, Ahmad's father was exercising the power of forgiveness the power to be a survivor and not a victim, the power to be a peacemaker. And there is hope in our world when we can forgive like that. Seeing the humanity of others. I think it begins by realizing that all of us are very much programmed by the life that we have lived. Just like a computer is programmed and only makes errors because we've inputted the wrong information, each one of us has been programmed by the life that we live, by the things that have influenced us in this life. And if we can start to see the influences in the people's lives who have hurt us and begin to understand where they're coming from, then we can begin to see them as human. It doesn't mean that justice isn't demanded. Forgiveness and justice are not the same thing. But when it comes to our ability to forgive, it means we can let go of the hurt in that wound and we can heal. We can heal and we can start a new beginning. 
The bottom line, my friends, is to understand that as long as we are breathing, God can do and provide new things in our lives when we make room by receiving forgiveness and giving forgiveness. Jesus demonstrated the ultimate gift of forgiveness as he hung on the cross and he saw those who had inflicted so much pain and insults on him. He was able to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They are your children. You created them. And they are doing things without understanding. Forgiveness is always hard. But Jesus promised that he would give us the power to do what he had done. Greater things than I have done, he said, you will be able to do because of the power of the Holy Spirit at work in your lives. Corey Tin Boone, many of you recognize that name. She was a survivor of the Holocaust of World War II. She became a Christian, and one day she spoke at a church in Munich, Germany. And as she talked about her time in Ravensbrück camp, after her message, a man came up to her. He was a former guard in the camp. She didn't recognize him, but she remembered very deeply what he and others had done to her and her sister and the people that she loved. He came up to her and he said, I want to thank you for your talk. And I want to ask you for your forgiveness. And he stuck out his hand. And Corey Tin Boone writes, At that moment I was seized with fear. Because I knew what evil had happened and that he was a part of it. And there he stood asking for my forgiveness and I knew what Jesus wanted me to do. But I didn't think I could do it. So I said a prayer. I said, Jesus, you've asked me to forgive as I have been forgiven. Help me to do it. So she says she woodenly reached out her hand and shook the man's hand. And when she did, she said that she was filled with an overwhelming sense of God's love at work in her life. Overwhelming sense of the power, the power to forgive because she was willing to just simply lift her hand and trust that God would give her the strength to say, I forgive. My friends, that's my prayer <clears throat> for each one of us, that we can trust that God will give us the power if we will but reach out our hand and ask for the power to forgive and be set free to live. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, may it be so. Amen.